Hello. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's been a pleasure to hear the previous contribution to this lecture. And um, so yeah, my name is Valentina Chiapanunes. I'm a senior project leader in NVRDV. And today I would like to show you um, our sustainability strategy through a series of examples. Uh, thinking of the theme of uh, today's lecture, uh, I wanted to start it with a small introduction uh, in relation to the general um, DNA of MVRDV. And I think it's interesting to see a little bit the relation between the past projects, how we started and how this uh, is implemented right now. So um, basically, yeah. So. Uh, first of all, we, are, we have an office in five locations in the world. We, the main location is in Rotterdam. Uh, we have an office in Berlin, Paris, and Shanghai. Um, this is our main office in Rotterdam. And uh, we are about 300 people with uh, 35 nationality and different expertise from uh, urban design, uh, architecture, and interior. Um, and we uh, work on uh, several scales, certain from architecture, of course, is our main field, uh, landscape urbanism and interior as well. Um, I wanted to start today with this image from the expo uh, from 2000. Um, and I think this image is quite interesting because in here you can already see um, one of the concepts that we have been uh, developing since a long time. So here is a, you can see, let's say, a series of uh, Dutch landscape that uh, we stacked on top of each other. So um, basically here you can already see the integration of uh, uh, several sustainable principles, one on top of each other. So here is the physical model of the project. And uh, so you can see how, let's say, the production of energy, green, and public space were stuck on top of each other. So. This image is also quite nice to see how the green was, so this is one of the floor of the pavilion and green was in there. So as architects today, we always try to integrate green and it was nice to see how already in, back then uh, we managed to achieve that. Uh, another theme also related to dance, uh, density is um, basically um, the idea, so this is the Lego model for the Y factory uh, in the University of Delft, uh, and uh, this is uh, a typical kind of Italian uh, village. So we want to try to merge the human scale, on, but let's say in, in a density level. So how to achieve this quality of the public space and human scale on a, on a larger scale, basically. So then um, if I try to find that principle in a more recent project, uh, I thought it was nice to show you the valley. So this is the project uh, we, fi we finished this year, and it's a um, high rise in the city of Amsterdam. And uh, it's a um, multifunctional building where we integrate uh, public plinth office and residential. And uh, here you can see indeed the, um, the relation with this human scale. So, the different terraces are uh, made to accommodate the terraces for the residents. We also have an open plinth and a route that you can climb up. And of course, each terrace accommodates green. So here you can see you are much more elevated. So it's a totally different scale, but you can still have this kind of village-like uh, feeling, basically. And here you can see the terraces. Um, the, the, this randomization of the shape was actually studied quite in detail and also with some script to uh, ensure the privacy be between the residents, the integration of green daylight, as I mentioned, and uh, um, including also, for instance, the pattern of the facade that you see here was script to optimize the uh, size of the panel, and, but also to keep this kind of uh, random feeling. And this is from the top where you can see the public route uh, going up. So um, 
in the relation to this kind of uh, terrace making and uh, the density. Another theme that uh, is also present, let's say, in the uh, history of MVRDV is the appropriation of the roof uh, uh, within the city. So this project is back from 2006, and it was a private client that uh, asked us to uh, renovate his house. So he was owning the top layer, and this was a kind of addition uh, additional floor, so uh, you can see how, again, here you have this kind of village type, but on top of a building. And um, their relation with the rooftops is a theme that is present uh, in many of the projects of MVRDV. So this is a temporary installation in, Rot in the center of Rotterdam from 2016, and it was the first attempt to uh, bring this first idea also more into a public level. So uh, here we tried to um, make these stairs so everybody could walk uh, up this uh, building and then uh, you would access the roof terrace. So this was a bit the beginning of a larger research that uh, we started after that that is called the rooftop catalog. So in here we kind of explored uh, different ways and opportunities to uh, utilize the rooftop of the buildings. Uh, starting from uh, adding program, integrate green, produce energy and green and improve uh, biodiversity within the city. So um, finally in 2000, so this year basically we open up these other um, stairs and bridges in the center of Rotterdam again. It was uh, quite successful and uh, we could really implement this research in something built. Um, but finally, I think what is also really interesting that after this project, we um, managed to collaborate with the municipality. Um, and uh, so this is called Roofscape. And uh, so it's basically a mapping of the uh, um, available of all the roofs of Rotterdam, but especially the one that are giving opportunity to implement uh, new spaces within the cities. And, we roughly calculated that we have like 18 uh, square kilometers of surface that is possible to utilize. So this is a kind of first step to translate this uh, first concept in almost like, like uh, urban policy because then municipality will uh, implement with the, uh, this concept with the private owners. So then, for instance, if you would need to make a green corridor, you would get subsidy to make your... Uh, a roof green, for instance. So uh, it's nice to see towards all this year how this uh, idea, uh, this concept has developed, basically. Um, last one on the roof uh, is the rooftop of the Bymans Museum in Rotterdam. So again, uh, green integration into the roof on top of the museum, open for everybody. Um, so this was a kind of first uh, round of introduction of how MVRDV approached this, uh, this kind of theme. And then I would like to give it a bit more a direction on a more contemporary topic. So we know that uh, around the world, everything is uh, changing. And how do we deal with this? So uh, we see that we have uh, even more and more pressure on this topic, and we need to react fast. Um, and we also need to be really responsible and uh, realistic on this topic, so we know that uh, Forty percent of the CO2 emission are coming from the build industry, as we said over the past two days a lot in these uh, lectures, and uh, so we really need to take in that into account. Is both production of material and operational uh, emissions, and uh, we know that basically we are uh, in the reality. There is still a lot of construction going on, and not too many enough changes, I would say. Uh, in relation to this topic. So we really need to change the way we build. And uh, so then, let's say I would like to link this uh, in a bit more funny way. So often there is this idea that green buildings are ugly. So it's a bit of a thought, like, how can we uh, start thinking of that in a more sexy way? How can we implement buildings and detach our uh, thoughts in, in relation to this. And um, so then the question is, is it really true? Can we <laughs> make uh, beautiful buildings if we follow this uh, strategy? So here I have uh, uh, selected uh, 
uh, four topics. Uh, so rather than showing one project after the, the other, is more like I group them following this for strategy that is a bit our focus to try to react to climate change. So one is energy, uh, carbon footprint, circularity, and resiliency. Um, in relation to uh, energy, I'm not talking only about the production of energy itself, but also uh, the consumption of energy w within the buildings. So um, we know that uh, uh, cities need to be more and more self-sufficient. We don't want to end up having this uh, kind of city, so uh, we should integrate sustainability in an early stage of design. So this is an example of a, a, a building that we opened uh, this year as well in, in France, and uh, the focus on this design was really passive uh, strategies and reduction of ener consumption of energy uh, from the really beginning of the project. And uh, this is another interesting uh, um, project that um, uh, is a warehouse. And uh, usually warehouses are really simple and cubics. And here the client was willing to uh, invest more to uh, create this facade where we integrate solar. So and this uh, was from the early stage of the concept. So it was really like a way of rethinking the warehouse and the production of energy is on, on levels. Um, and then I have one more that is in Shanghai. It's going to be the, the construction is going to start the next year. And here it's more about integration of uh, uh, a canopy that will reduce a lot the heat within the building, for instance. Um, we are. We're working a lot with uh, softwares to uh, make solar studies and uh, heat control, more uh, using, of course, new tools. And uh, in relation to this, I thought it was also interesting to show a project that is, uh, we started in 2010. Um, uh, we call it the Ville Intime in, in French, and um, it means basically the intimate, intimate city. Um, and uh, this was the, our motto for this project is designed by the sun. So uh, because it was back then, 2010, we, did, we were not using too much the software that we use today. So it's a bit uh, more low tech, but I think it's quite powerful to explain a little bit uh, the way we work. Um, so we are in Bordeaux in France, uh, in this area. Uh, you can see here the plot line. It's, uh, the city center is on this side, and we are in front in an industrial area. So um, the first thought was like, how can we relate to the city center? Is going to be a mirror of it or not? How uh, we integrate the industrial um, identity of the site within the project, and also how we take into account the water, because they had a lot of problem with uh, flooding in that area. Um, so here you see a photo of the city, and our side is on the other side, and this is really like the city center and the skyline of Bordeaux, how it looks, and so it's something we wanted to relate to. Um, and on the other side, indeed, we have the industrial identity. So we had these two kind of layers of history to take into account, um, and the railing of the uh, railway station as well. So this is our site. Um, in the existing situation, uh, first we took into account the, um, the railway as a kind of uh, uh, imprint in the master plan to uh, define the streets of the master plan. And then we invert it to create the public spaces. We uh, just kind of apply in one go the, the, the imprint of it, so it's a kind of extrusion. And from here, um, we start cutting. So the, this is a bit what uh, the reason why I call it design by the sun. So um, starting from this really simple extrusion, we started to cut in relation to certain angles. And um, the first one was to be able to have uh, sunlight till the ground floor. So it's a 45 degree angle. And this is more to have a relation with the neighborhood. So depending, in this case, it's 22 degrees. In another situation, we had different cuts, but it's always like uh, try to respect the neighbor. And uh, so the, the building will not shade one into each other. Um, 
So here you can see the section of the additional cut. Uh, the result of all of these steps um, is the creation of a master plan with a lot of different typologies and sizes and uh, a really unique um, identity and a, 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 a unique skyline somehow. And um, this was the perfect way to create uh, surfaces to integrate solar and uh, of course to have this really intimate city, narrow streets, pedestrian oriented, where you can also integrate green and public space. And then the last layer in the concept phase was also integration of the um, water treatment. So in this area they had a lot of flooding and after mapping the quantity of water that was needed, we have been since even the master plan phase integrate into the design, um, basically a water storage under each house. So if you think of it, that this was 2010 and how the problem of water right now is uh, really urgent, uh, it's interesting to see that uh, even with urban planning, you can integrate these kind of strategies. Um, and so this is more like in a 3D, so this, you see how these are basically the volumes of the industrial part, and this is how it will look after our intervention. Um, and somehow this uh, landscape of roof reminds a little bit of the historical center, but on the other hand is creating something really new. Um, and then the reason why I also wanted to bring it up today is because after years of implementation, in 2020, we managed to finish the first building, and uh, you can see uh, here in uh, how it was uh, finished. So this really kind of interesting uh, massing um, of the roofs and how they are integrated. So also, basically, almost there is no difference between the facade and the roof, and is treated as one surface. Um, and right now, we are uh, implementing many more blocks and we are basically supervising the overall master plan with also many different architectural office that will follow, let's say, our set of rules to create the mess with different facade. And this is from uh, a bird view, so you see also the contrast between the outer facade and the inner courtyard. Um, yeah, just to mention, uh, I think in this building we have about 140 units and uh, at least 40 of them are social housing. So uh, it's also interesting to see how you can um, integrate different targets group and, and, see, and still keep a really high quality in the living. So this is the inner court here. Right, um, yeah, this is an exhibition and uh, in the center of Bordeaux where uh, the shape of the blocks were placed as a kind of sculpture. Um, the second topic I have for today is the carbon footprint. Uh, as we know, it's uh, really important to take that into account. And as a designer, uh, it's difficult to think of that because often we are in this really creative phase where we try to uh, achieve a certain concept, but we, then it's difficult to kind of quantify that. So uh, and very DVB internally, we have been kind of uh, uh, tried to research a lot on this and finally we, since a couple of years, we have a, what we call carbon scape, so it's to forecast embodied CO2 emission in buildings and um, for us it's really important because usually you do that a lot towards the end of the process of a building, so uh, towards construction and especially when you want to get the uh, building qualified, but uh, what we think it's important is to uh, in integrate that and have a knowledge of the carbon footprint from the be really the beginning of the project. So uh, we developed this script that in takes into account uh, quite some parameters, but basically it's uh, really interesting because even from a simple mass, we already know and quantify how many facades we, we are gonna have and uh, uh, if it's, the, 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 of course, if the volume is more fragmented, you will have more carbon footprint. So already, even if, of course, you don't, we don't want to use it as a pure design tool, uh, it creates a lot of aware awareness in our uh, design process. 
uh, and then I wanted to add a couple of more projects that are under construction with uh, timber that is basically uh, probably the least uh, carbon footprint material that we can use at the moment. So this is a uh, apartment block in Paris that is hybrid actually. So the uh, plinth is still uh, uh, in concrete and the uh, interiors are going to be fully in timber, which is really nice. So you also can use that and link a lot with the quality of living. So create different atmosphere and uh, this type of interiors. And then the last one, um, uh, in relation to this topic is a pavilion um, for the, it's called the Next 500 Expo you know, of Fugerei, so in Germany. So Fugerei is a social housing organization in Germany, and uh, we have been doing a lot of research with them. Um, and then as a result of all this research, uh, we have been placing this pavilion uh, in the um, city center square, and. This is basically the shape of a typical uh, uh, German social housing block deformated to uh, um, have this more kind of sculptural uh, aesthetics. And uh, it was used for an exhibition where we uh, explain our research, but I thought it was uh, interesting in this case to show the actual pavilion. Uh, so it's all prefab uh, panels, double curved and placed, and uh, this image shows the pavilion in another location because the idea was to build it, dismantle it, and rebuilding it again in other locations so it can be uh, moved. Then the next topic is circularity. So how can we reuse the buildings, and also not only the buildings, but it's also material and in different scales. So that would be basically, it's a really important topic to fit to into climate adaptation and uh, circularity in general. So the first project I wanted to share is the, um, is the reuse of uh, lighting elements uh, for Delta Light. So that we collaborated with Delta Light and we designed these lamps and the lamps are made from uh, um, rest of profiles that the company usually would throw away or recycle. and. Uh, so it was also here kind of a long uh, design process to achieve these kind of uh, shapes, but it's interesting to see the reuse of the material. And then uh, I will quickly show the reuse of this uh, building in uh, Shenzhen. Originally, we were supposed to work on this site and consider this building as uh, demolished and finally we, talking with a client, we managed to convince them to keep it and to, to develop more like a project of restoration rather than total new construction. Um, so here you can see several strategies, how we uh, develop the renovation of it, but the most important part is the roof. So we integrate its roof with the uh, public space pockets. Uh, this is all bamboo planting, so really thin layer of green because of the weight. And then uh, we also recess the facade. So uh, finally you had this uh, loggia that uh, is used a lot also as a stage and for events. So we kind of uh, give a new life to this building that was supposed to be demolished completely. Um, the last topic is the climate adaptation. And um, in relation to this theme, uh, I wanted to quickly explain you our uh, sea level rise catalog. So uh, in relation to the raising of the sea level, we have been developing a catalog of building um, to uh, react and adapt to it. And uh, this was uh, mainly implemented in Vancouver. So this is the waterfront of Vancouver, and uh, this is how it looks today. And after this process of research and catalogization of possible strategies in relation to this theme, this is how you could have it tomorrow. So with the floating elements in the waters that they can survive even if the water is raising, uh, lifted platforms. And then if you would think of it in uh, 2,000 so in 100 years, um, even you would have to think of buildings that are completely flooded. So we also want to kind of uh, be realistic on this, so you would have to really accept that certain buildings will not survive this kind of process, and 
for instance, here we would keep the structure only and we would convert it in a public space. So, um, in this, uh, in relation to this concept, uh, we, it, this, exact, this principle was kind of implemented in uh, Tainan Spring. Uh, we call it reuse by cooling. So, in this case, uh, here we are in Taiwan. We are in the what you see on the top is the Tainan Canal. Uh, originally, uh, in this location, it was uh, situated the harbor of Tainan, and uh, in the years they started to build everywhere. So this was originally water, and they've been building this uh, block that was uh, the Chinatown Mall, and it was underused. So uh, finally the municipality decided to demolish it, and in this process, we were involved to uh, implement the public space and the also ecological connection of the overall area, so we studied also this in a larger scale, but uh, what I wanted to show today is this uh, intervention, so uh, what we, decide, we decided to basically demolish fully the, um, the mall uh, till the parking level, so this was the original parking, and we decided to keep the columns. So this gives a little bit of uh, kind of uh, Roman farum uh, feeling. And, uh, and then, of course, it was flooded. So the, the water here plays a big role in relation to the cooling and to the climate adaptation, and uh, also in relation to the sea level and the collection of water. So the, uh, this water has a flexible level depending on the season and on the rain. So it can be higher and lower is connecting to uh, water storage. And of course, it's a beautiful public space, uh, getting really popular, especially for kids and uh, for playing. So here you can see some uh, photos during the summer. They also have these mist uh, sprinkles. And here you can see it uh, during the night. Um, so the next project is called One Green Mile, and it's in Mumbai. And uh, it's again um, one project that takes into account reuse, but I think uh, this project has, uh, is having, let's say, a much greater impact on the more, let's say, social aspect of sustainability. So we call it design for the community. So uh, we are in Mumbai, and uh, we, are, we are asked by the municipality together with the uh, private investor to look into the, these main axes of the city. Uh, if we look at this main road, is uh, 11 kilometers long. Uh, specifically, we were asked to look more in detail in 1.5 kilometers, more on a strategic level, and then finally 800 meters more for our specific implementation. Um, the, this street is uh, partially covered by this infrastructure, and the space under it is underused. So the, the client wanted to create a new, they define basically a new street uh, profile for this area. And see, you see here how it looks, uh, how it looked before last year, basically. Um, and here there is a bit of a summary of what, what were the problem uh, at that time. So. We have a difficult accessibility for pedestrian and use areas, as I said, lack of green, although it was sometimes green under it, a lot of pollution from cars, no public space, and lack of uh, street furniture. So basically, the full street was kind of dominated by car, as you could see from the photos. And um, what we try to implement, of course, is the, the focus was more on the pedestrian and on the public space that would be under the flyover create some protection, tend to, uh, lighting, of course, make it much more pedestrian friendly, integrate bike, and uh, look into biodiversity, of course, and um, plants that can clean the air, so for pollution will help. Um, and part of the concept uh, uh, was related to introducing a new hilly landscape. The idea of this landscape is also to, let's say, give freedom to the pedestrians to, um, uh, uh, let's say, use the space as they want it. So with the different slopes, you don't even have to define too much which one is the sitting element and where you would lay down, but 
people will be free to interpret the space in different ways and use it as they like it. Um, and then another layer in the concept was to, uh, so if on one hand there was this kind of freedom in the use of Spain, we still introduce this urban room, so several program was uh, set up and uh, that was mainly, let's say, in between the beams of the infrastructure, so each section was uh, defined uh, more for one user or the other, and we also studied a lot uh, um, how the space will be used during the day and who will be coming there. Um, and here you see a little bit of an overview of one of the main uh, fragments. Uh, one, this is uh, basically this long uh, blue stripe. It was more to create a certain identity that you would recognize that is a space that is this uh, one kilometer long, basically, because we are starting from this really uh, short fragments, but potentially uh, the client wants us to develop a strategy that will be able to be stretched out along the full length. And uh, so last year they finalized the construction and um, I think it was really popular, especially because of indeed the people were coming there a lot and it was really crowded and really appreciated. So even if it was relatively short, contribution and interaction, we, I think we achieved a lot. Um, and uh, we made this uh, beautiful pathway. So the, I think is my last uh, project for today. Uh, it's a more like a, um, a group of projects, actually. Um, so it's about Floriade Green City. Floriade is a green expo that was uh, happened uh, this year in Almere in the Netherlands. Uh, it's an expo that is happening every 10 years in the Netherlands and is about uh, food production, agriculture, and greenery. Um, and uh, it's a project that we started really long time ago and uh, within the process we implement also many different areas in this region. So uh, before jumping into the actual Floriade, I wanted to describe a few more projects within the region. So this is the Almer region. Here is where you, if, uh, is the actual Almer city is here in the middle. And uh, even before starting Floriade, we have been implementing a lot of urban uh, planning strategy within the region. And one of the main problem of this area is that typology is pretty basic and I would say a bit boring. So, um, and basically every street looks like this in any kind of neighborhood. So. One uh, first point was, okay, how to not avoid this and how to introduce a, a more variety in the residential neighborhood. So this was the first step. So uh, yellow and red is a program out of the residential. So try to reduce the amount of residential, uh, implement with a mix of program and also mix of uh, different typologies. So this was really kind of on a large scale and um, we tried to apply that in the Armere Ostervont. Um, this project is uh, quite interesting. We call it ruling freedom. So uh, it's also in relation a little bit with the housing market in general. Um, so we know the housing market is now really overloaded right now. It's really difficult to, in the Netherlands especially, to buy a house and to find something to rent. And, um, so it's the target of this project is a bit like for people that really want to build something for themselves. Um, so this is the Almera region I just showed before, and the, this master plan was made more on this uh, side of the city. And uh, basically here, the, the region is basically a super typical Dutch landscape. Um, and then we had to take into account, of course, uh, the old existing situation, road network, existing houses, water, uh, really important, and vegetation. And um, the first concept was really based on how to uh, integrate living and agriculture. So we have this landscape. We, there is a really, really urge need of new houses and a lot of people that are also willing to uh, control this process more. 
So then uh, how do you actually merge the agriculture with the city? And uh, so this is the first diagram that shows how usually, so this is the existing situation on top of the program. You have road, public space, housing, and uh, agricultural land. The first step is to implement the program, so our increase the residential program, integrate the public function, green, and of course agriculture. And the, uh, this diagram kind of show the way we thought, so instead of uh, combining one development, the overall responsibility of the program, each individual will take care of a strip of it. So basically with a really simple set of rules, uh, then we will leave a boundary of freedom within this concept. So basically, I will not go too much into detail, but basically each individual that will get a plot in this land will have to take care of the connection to the, so their own road to the main road. They will have a limitation on how much they can build. They, they need to have a minimum of agricultural land and public space green. They will have to take care of their own sewage and then uh, the only part that they will have to connect to is actually portable water, but let's say energy, sewage, and green, and agriculture will be all uh, developed by themselves. So um, this concept, uh, it's, it's important because from the individual, you start to implement like a collaboration between the different users. And uh, so basically, let's say, if you follow these really simple rules, then you can decide where you want to live. So do you want to live on a star-shaped house or you want to have a strip or you want to m make a letter out of it uh, is up to you. But as soon as you follow these really simple rules, so here is a kind of step how you, a potential piece of land will be developed. And, uh, and so this is a kind of how can we uh, rule a bit the chaos or how can you get also beauty out, out of the chaos. And what is funny is that this is actually happening. So here you can see how if you want to build a yellow house, a green house, or whatever shape you want, this is happening. <laughs> and uh, so yeah, this is basically the chaos that is happening right now. But I find really interesting that within this chaos, you are having the freedom to develop uh, what you need and uh, is uh, creating really self-sufficient and sustainable housing development. So in the same region, going back to Floriade, we have been developing the actual Expo of Floriade. The theme of this year was uh, growing green cities. These were the basic theme given by the municipality and the client and how we implement it. And uh, this is also a, little, a diagram that shows a little bit the uh, theme also in relation to the previous project. So, if we think of a green city in the traditional way where we ideally were creating a self-sufficient society, we know how the global city is developing and especially because of density, you have a lot of logistics, so food production is often out of the city, you have to transport, you have to create energy. So the Floriade is a, an opportunity to develop a green city concept and really integrate all of these different layers together. Um, so here I'm kind of zooming in the city of uh, Almere. You can see this uh, lighter part up that is the city center, and this is the lake of Almere, and Floriade is in front. Um, and you see here this uh, construct in elevation, so this is the city center of Almere, and the Floriade region in front, that is a, uh, it was a, already really green. Um, so f to develop the concept of the Expo Floriade, the first step was to kind of mirror the city center in uh, creating a kind of green city uh, mirror of, the, of it. So if you are in the city, you see the opposite of it in front. And at the same time, if you are in the Floriade side, you see Almere there. Um, so this is looking from the other way, and you see the existing situation and the overlap of this uh, new green pattern. And uh, what is, was really important for us, uh, even if it looks like a bit uh, overimposed shape on top of an existing situation, is that um, basically the, let me see if I see the plan, yeah. The, 
this really simple grid pattern uh, somehow underline what was already there because it's really natural. So then the uh, existing green will pop out more. Uh, let me see if uh, the next diagram I will uh, show it better. And then let's say uh, each of these patchwork uh, was uh, thought as part of this green net, uh, the green concept of the Floriade itself. So which kind of green are we talking about? No? So it's about uh, the intensive green of agriculture, uh, forest, or uh, uh, food production, uh, greenhouses, more like uh, food production in a more technological way. Um, also the consumption of energy, of course, for that and biodiversity. So all of these green layers are kind of combined and um, implemented into this grid. And here you can see more the so basically, all of these are, it was exist, existing trees. All the trees that you see are existing. Uh, the infrastructure, of course, is existing. So somehow within this pattern, you see popping out uh, what was already there. Um, and then another aspect that is uh, really important of this project is um, all of these explo flow, flow that, we, that were done in the previous years were always um, let's say the focus is the event, and as we know also for other types of expo, you don't know what to do with it after that. So it's a really like a huge investment for a short time. So um, this kind of uh, strategy was really try to think of, okay, Floriade is an expo, it's a few months or a year max, and then um, how can we really think of it as a potential residential neighborhood after it? Um, and so here you see it in 3D. I will show you more the implementation in some photos. Uh, first, I wanted to show you the uh, green concept. The landscape concept uh, is a collection of all the species that are growing in the Netherlands and in general in the north of Europe. And uh, the concept here is to place them in the alphabetical order, starting from A to Z. And, uh, also taking into account the different scale of the trees. And so within a plot also, this is a bit the order, the how it's uh, placed inside as a kind of barcode uh, layer. Um, right. So here you see all the different species applied into the plot. And this is more like uh, how the plot in general is organized. So you have a program, a green production of energy and the pavilion itself, uh, how we implement the facade, maybe now we'll uh, go a bit faster. How potentially you can apply this barcode concept also on the pavilion itself. And then uh, I add a couple of more slides on uh, one of the buildings that we were supposed to design. So at one point of the overall process, we proposed this gigantic sphere, which the client said, no, <laughs> you're not going to do this. <laughs> and finally, they built this. So uh, we, didn't, we didn't manage to implement uh, that idea, but uh, we try hard to finally convert the building into something nicer. And um, so here we um, were collaborating with a graphic designer that draw this uh, beautiful pattern. And the idea was to uh, project all the species within the master plan, uh, uh, kind of making them uh, join into the art of the master plan and then project it into the facade. And then the um, graphic designer uh, with a layer of interpretation apply this but uh, made this drawing into the facade that was actually printed and converted into the facade. So just to have some, um, and then in the bottom of the facade, the, this uh, list of species is actually printed. So if you go there, you have an overview of the different species. And this was the um, view we submitted when we were still on the concept phase. And then, uh, so, how I explain all the concept, uh, I think uh, I thought was also interesting to show a little bit the process of the construction of the Floriade. So you see when we started to uh, build this grid pattern and how the existing trees were integrated, the road network, 
uh, starting to plant new trees, uh, leave the reservation of a street of six meters, but still have a really um, open paving, and the uh, plantation of the first shrubs. This is uh, in April, so when the green was not uh, really grow yet, and this is uh, uh, during the opening, so when actually the Floriade was uh, open. And uh, yeah, somehow it's interesting to think of it now as a really big garden, but with an eye that uh, this will become soon uh, also a residential neighborhood. So the, we are in um, talking now with the, all the investors and the municipality to uh, implement the garden uh, uh, with new residential programs. So you finally will see this uh, integration of uh, basically a productive landscape and houses at the same time. Um, so you can see here some more photos. The, it's also nice to see how, so in the Netherlands it's really common that uh, people that are living in the city are having this uh, allotment garden, so they go a bit outside the city and they grow their veggies there, and um, this uh, basically looks like an allotment garden but scale up uh, in the size of a city. Uh, so you can see here some more photos from above. And I think, uh, I don't know if I have, no, that was my last project, so then, yeah, what's coming next, uh, we don't know yet, but uh, we want to definitely keep integrating all of these layers in our uh, design process, and uh, we want to think of uh, the future city in, still in a kind of positive way, and uh, we think of the city as uh, really a place that needs to be safe, happy, inclusive, healthy, connected, responsible, biodiverse, resilient, regenerative, carbon neutral, self-sustained, circular, and beautiful. <laughs> Thank you.